slept in it again, for I believe it to have been haunted in a very terrible and practical manner. Now, most ghosts, when all is said and done, do not do much harm. They may perhaps terrify, but the person whom they visit usually gets over their visitation. They may, on the other hand, be entirely friendly and beneficent. But the appearances in the Villa Cascana were not beneficent, and had they made their visit in a very slightly different manner, I do not suppose I should have got over it more than Arthur Ingalls did. The house stood on an ilex-clad hill not far from Sestri di Levante on the Italian Riviera, looking out over the iridescent blues of that enchanted sea, while behind it rose the pale green chestnut woods that climb up the hillsides till they give place to the pines that, black in contrast with them, crown the slopes. All round it the garden, in the luxuriance of mid-spring, bloomed and was fragrant, and the scent of magnolia and rose, borne on the salt freshness of the winds from the sea, flowed like a stream through the cool vaulted rooms. On the ground floor, a broad pillared loggia ran round three sides of the house, the top of which formed a balcony for certain rooms on the first floor. The main staircase, broad and of grey marble steps, led up from the hall to the landing outside these rooms, which were three in number, namely two big sitting rooms and a bedroom arranged en suite. The latter was unoccupied. The sitting rooms were in use. From here, the main staircase continued up to the second floor, where were situated certain bedrooms, one of which I occupied, while on the other side of the first floor landing, some half dozen steps led to another suite of rooms where, at the time I'm speaking of, Arthur Ingalls, the artist, had his bedroom and studio. Thus, the landing outside my bedroom, at the top of the house, commanded both the landing of the first floor and also the steps that led to Ingalls' rooms. Jim Stanley and his wife, finally, whose guest I was, occupied rooms in another wing of the house, where also were the servants' quarters. I arrived just in time for lunch on a brilliant noon of mid-May. The garden was shouting with colour and fragrance, and not less delightful after my broiling walk up from the marina should have been the coming from the reverberating heat and blaze of the day into the marble coolness of the villa. Only, the reader has my bare word for this and nothing more, the moment I set foot in the house I felt that something was wrong. This feeling, I may say, was quite vague, though very strong, and I remember that when I saw letters waiting for me on the table in the hall I felt certain that the explanation was here. I was convinced that there was bad news of some sort for me. Yet, when I opened them, I found no such explanation of my premonition. My correspondence all reeked of prosperity. Yet this clear miscarriage of a presentiment did not dissipate my uneasiness. In that cool, fragrant house there was something wrong. I am at pains to mention this, because it may explain why it was that, though I am as a rule so excellent a sleeper that the extinction of a light on getting into bed is apparently contemporaneous with being called on the following morning, I slept very badly on my first night in the Villa Cascana. It may also explain that fact that when I did sleep, if it was indeed in sleep that I saw what I thought I saw, I dreamed in a very vivid and original manner, original, that is to say, in the sense that something which, as far as I knew, had never previously entered into my consciousness, usurped it then. But since, in addition to this evil premonition, certain words and events occurring during the rest of the day might have suggested something of what I thought happened that night, it will be well to relate them. After lunch, then, I went round the house with Mrs. Stanley, and during our tour she referred, it is true, to the unoccupied bedroom on the first floor, which opened out of the room where we had lunched. We left that unoccupied, 
she said, because Jim and I have a charming bedroom and dressing room, as you saw in the wing, and if we used it ourselves, we should have to turn the dining room into a dressing room and have our meals downstairs. As it is, however, we have our little flat there. Arthur Ingalls has his little flat in the other passage, and I remembered, aren't I extraordinary, that you once said that the higher up you were in a house, the better you were pleased. So I, I put you at the top of the house in, in, instead of giving you that room. It is true that a doubt, vaguely as my uneasy premonition crossed my mind at this, I did not see why Mrs. Stanley should have explained all this, if there had not been more to explain. I allow, therefore, that the thought that there was something to explain about the unoccupied bedroom was momentarily present to my mind. The second thing that may have borne on my dream was this. At dinner the conversation turned for a moment on ghosts. Ingalls, with a certainty of conviction, expressed his belief that anybody who could possibly believe in the existence of supernatural phenomena was unworthy of the name of an ass. Well, the subject instantly dropped. As far as I can recollect, nothing else occurred or was said that could bear on what follows. We all went to bed rather early, and personally I yawned my way upstairs, feeling hideously sleepy. My room was rather hot, and I threw all the windows wide, and from without poured in the white light of the moon and the love song of many nightingales. I undressed quickly and got into bed, but though I had felt so sleepy before, I now felt extremely wide awake. But I was quite content to be awake. I did not toss or turn. I felt perfectly happy listening to the song and seeing the light. Then it is possible I may have gone to sleep, and what follows may have been a dream. I thought, anyhow, that after a time the nightingale ceased singing, and the moon sank. I thought also that if, for some unexplained reason, I was going to lie awake all night, I might as well read, and I remembered that I had left a book in which I was interested in the dining room on the first floor, so I got out of bed, lit a candle, and went downstairs. I entered the room, saw on a side table the book I'd come to look for, and then, simultaneously, saw that the door into the unoccupied bedroom was open. A curious grey light, not of dawn, nor of moonshine, came out of it, and I looked in. The bed stood just opposite the door, a big four-poster hung with tapestry at the head. Then I saw that the greyish light of the bedroom came from the bed, or rather from what was on the bed, for it was covered with great caterpillars, a foot or more in length, which crawled over it. They were faintly luminous, and it was the light from them that showed me the room. Instead of the sucker feet of ordinary caterpillars, they had rows of pincers like crabs, and they moved by grasping what they lay on with their pincers, and then sliding their bodies forward. In colour these dreadful insects were yellowish-grey, and they were covered with irregular lumps and swellings. There must have been hundreds of them, for they formed a sort of writhing, crawling pyramid on the bed. Occasionally, one fell off onto the floor with a soft, fleshy thud, and though the floor was of hard concrete, it yielded to the pincer feet as if it had been putty, and, crawling back, the caterpillar would mount onto the bed again to rejoin its fearful companions. They appeared to have no faces, so to speak, but at one end of them there was a mouth that opened sideways in respiration. Then, as I looked, it seemed to me as if they all suddenly became conscious of my presence. All the mouths, at any rate, were turned in my direction, and next moment they began dropping off the bed with those soft, fleshy thuds onto the floor and wriggling towards me. 
For one second, the paralysis of nightmare was on me, but the next, I was running upstairs again to my room, and I remember feeling the cold of the marble steps on my bare feet. I rushed into my bedroom and slammed the door behind me, and then, I was certainly wide awake now, I found myself standing by my bed with the sweat of terror pouring from me. The noise of the banged door still rang in my ears, but, as would have been more usual, if this had been mere nightmare, the terror that had been mine when I saw those foul beasts crawling about the bed or dropping softly onto the floor did not cease then. Awake now, if dreaming before, I did not at all recover from the horror of dream. It did not seem to me that I had dreamed. And until dawn I sat or stood, not daring to lie down, thinking that every rustle or movement that I heard was the approach of the caterpillars. To them and the claws that bit into the cement the wood of the door was child's play. Steel would not keep them out. But with the sweet and noble return of day, the horror vanished. The whisper of wind became benignant again. The nameless fear, whatever it was, was smoothed out and terrified me no longer. Dawn broke, hueless at first, then it grew dove-coloured. Then the flaming pageant of light spread over the sky. The admirable rule of the house was that everybody had breakfast where and when he pleased, and in consequence it was not till lunchtime that I met any of the other members of our party, since I had breakfast on my balcony and wrote letters and other things till lunch. In fact, I got down to that meal rather late after the other three had begun, between my knife and fork there was a small pillbox of cardboard, and as I sat down, Engel spoke. "'Do look at that,' he said, "'since you're interested in natural history. I found it crawling on my counterpane last night. I don't know what it is.' I think that before I opened the pillbox I expected something of the sort which I found in it. Inside it, anyhow, was a small caterpillar, greyish-yellow in colour, with curious bumps and excrescences on its rings. It was extremely active and hurried round the box this way and that. Its feet were unlike the feet of any caterpillar I ever saw. They were like the pincers of a crab. I looked and shut the lid down again. No, I, I, I don't know it, I said, but it looks rather unwholesome. Um, what are you going to do with it? "'Oh, I shall keep it,' said Ingalls. "'It's begun to spin. "'I want to see what sort of a moth it turns into.' "'I opened the box again and saw that these hurrying movements "'were indeed the beginning of the spinning of the web of its cocoon. "'Then Ingalls spoke again. "'It's got funny feet, too,' he said. "'They're like crab's pincers. "'What's the Latin for crab? "'Oh, yes, cancer. "'So, in case it is unique, let's christen it, eh? "'Cancer inglesensis.' Then something happened in my brain, some momentary piecing together of all that I had seen or dreamed. Something in his words seemed to me to throw light on it all, and my own intense horror at the experience of the night before linked itself onto what he had just said. In effect, I took the box and threw it, caterpillar and all, out of the window. There was a gravel path just outside, and beyond it a fountain playing into a basin. The box fell onto the middle of this. Ingalls laughed. Ah, oh, so the students of the occult don't like solid facts, he said. Ha, my poor caterpillar! The talk went off again at once onto other subjects, and I've only given in detail as they happened these trivialities, in order to be sure myself that I've recorded everything that could have borne on occult subjects or on the subject of caterpillars. But at the moment when I threw the pillbox into the fountain, I lost my head. My only excuse is that, as is probably plain, the tenant of it was, in miniature, exactly what I had seen crowded onto the bed in the unoccupied room. And though this translation of those phantoms into flesh and blood, or whatever it is that caterpillars are made of, ought perhaps to have relieved the horror of the night, as a matter of fact it did nothing of the kind. It only made the crawling pyramid that covered the bed in the unoccupied room more hideously real. After lunch we spent a lazy hour or two strolling about the garden or sitting in the loggia. 
and it must have been about four o'clock when Stanley and I started off to bathe, down the path that led by the fountain into which I had thrown the pillbox. The water was shallow and clear, and at the bottom of it I saw its white remains. The soaking had disintegrated the cardboard, and it had become no more than a few strips and shreds of sodden paper. The centre of the fountain was a marble Italian cupid, which squirted the water out of a wineskin held under its arm. And crawling up its leg was the caterpillar. Strange and scarcely credible as it seemed, it must have survived the falling to bits of its prison and made its way to shore, and there it was, out of arm's reach, weaving and waving this way and that as it evolved its cocoon. Then, as I looked at it, it seemed to me again that, like the caterpillar I had seen last night, it saw me, and, breaking out of the threads that surrounded it, it crawled down the marble leg of the cupid and began swimming like a snake across the water of the fountain towards me. It came with extraordinary speed. The fact of a caterpillar being able to swim was new to me, and in another moment was crawling up the marble lip of the basin. And just then Ingalls joined us. Why, if it isn't old Cancer Inglesensis again, he said, catching sight of the beast. Ah, what a tearing hurry it's in. We were standing side by side on the path, and when the caterpillar had advanced to within about a yard of us, it stopped and began waving again, as if in doubt as to the direction in which it should go. Then it appeared to make up its mind and crawled onto Ingle's shoe. Well, it likes me best, he said. I don't really know that I like it, and as it won't drown, I think perhaps. He shook it off his shoe onto the gravel path and trod on it. All the afternoon the air got heavier and heavier, with a Sirocco that was without doubt coming up from the south, and that night again I went up to bed feeling very sleepy. But below my drowsiness, so to speak, there was the consciousness, stronger than before, that there was something wrong in the house, that something dangerous was close at hand. But I fell asleep at once, and how long after, I do not know, either woke or dreamed I awoke, feeling that I must get up at once, or I should be too late. Then, dreaming or awake, I lay and fought this fear, telling myself that I was but the prey of my own nerves, disordered by Sirocco or what not, and at the same time quite clearly knowing, in another part of my mind, so to speak, that every moment's delay added to the danger. At last this second feeling became irresistible, and I put on coat and trousers and went out of my room onto the landing. And then I saw that I had already delayed too long, and that I was now too late. The whole of the landing of the first floor below was invisible under the swarm of caterpillars that crawled there. The folding doors into the sitting-room from which opened the bedroom where I had seen them last night were shut, but they were squeezing through the cracks of it and dropping one by one through the keyhole, elongating themselves into mere string as they passed and growing fat and lumpy again on emerging. Some, as if exploring, were nosing about the steps into the passage at the end of which were Ingalls' rooms. Others were crawling on the lower steps of the staircase that led up to where I stood. The landing, however, was completely covered with them. I was cut off, and of the frozen horror that seized me when I saw that, I can give no idea in words. Then, at last, a general movement began to take place, and they grew thicker on the steps that led to Ingle's room. Gradually, like some hideous tide of flesh, they advanced along the passage, and I saw the foremost, visible by the pale grey luminousness that came from them, reach his door. Again and again I tried to shout and warn him in terror all the time that they should turn at the sound of my voice and mount my stair instead, but for all my efforts I felt that no sound came from my throat. They crawled along the hinge crack of his door, passing through as they had done before, and still I stood there making impotent efforts to shout to him, to bid him escape while there was time. At last the passage was completely empty. They had all gone, 
and at that moment I was conscious for the first time of the cold of the marble landing on which I stood barefooted. The dawn was just beginning to break in the eastern sky. Six months later, I met Mrs. Stanley in a country house in England. We talked on many subjects, and at last she said, I don't think I've seen you since I got that dreadful news about Arthur Ingalls a month ago. I haven't heard, said I. No, he's got cancer. They don't even advise an operation, for there's no hope of a cure. He is riddled with it, the doctors say. Now, during all these six months, I do not think a day had passed on which I had not in my mind the dreams, or whatever you like to call them, which I had seen in the Villa Cascana. I it is awful, is it not? she continued, and I feel I can't help feeling that he may have caught it at the villa, I asked. She looked at me in blank surprise. Why do you say that? she asked. How did you know? Then she told me. In the unoccupied bedroom a year before, there had been a fatal case of cancer. She had, of course, taken the best advice, and had been told that the utmost dictates of prudence would be obeyed so long as she did not put anybody to sleep in the room, which had also been thoroughly disinfected and newly whitewashed and painted. But 